Okay, good afternoon. This is the House Healthcare Committee once again. And uh, it's, is it March 30th, I think, somewhere around uh, 145. So uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We understand we have a limited period of time here and we have to go to the floor and I know you have a time commitment as well, but thank you for uh, scheduling this time with us. So what has prompted uh, our wanting to talk with you this afternoon uh, is the ongoing reports that we receive about the wait times in the emergency departments at Vermont hospitals for patients seeking mental health treatment. And I think it's just fair to say that, I mean, I, I know that those reports are reports that the department certainly is familiar with as well. And having just pulled up the last report, uh, we can see that there's really very discouraging uh, numbers. Uh, from my point of view, very discouraging numbers, particularly for youth waiting in emergency rooms. Uh, and it just seemed imperative that we re-engage uh, with the Department of Mental Health about this situation and about how we are trying to move ahead and what in fact we are able to achieve and in what time frame. So that's the introduction for me. Uh, and uh, I see that you have some folks, Commissioner, with you in addition to your Deputy Commissioner. So I've, well, maybe, maybe some people have come and gone, but uh, maybe not. Uh, so I, I welcome you to introduce yourself for the record, but also your staff who are with you. And then I really hope that we can in the next 40 minutes or so, really engage again about the wait times in the emergency departments for mental health patients, because it's quite concerning to our committee. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Commissioner, to start us off. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, for the record. My name is Emily Haas, Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, testifying alongside me today, um, I have Deputy Commissioner Allison Crump, and our mental health services director, Samantha Sweet. I'll start by saying thank you for having us today. We are grateful to our legislative partners for your attention and commitment um, and to being part of the solution. DMH takes this issue very seriously and we understand this system, uh, that this is system-wide and requires our- I'm going to interrupt you, Commissioner. Yeah. I think audio is not very good right now, and at least I'm having trouble. Hmm. Is, are other people able to understand? No, no. There's a, I think it's not just so. It's not just me. Um, perhaps you could. Uh, I can either go get someone or. I don't. Think, I, I, goes I, out and comes back in. I don't think it was is, on this end. Is this better? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's tremendous, <laughs> tremendous better. Thank you so much. Whatever you uh, did. You're welcome. Sorry, my microphone. I have three microphones I can choose from, and sometimes it chooses one I never use. But here we go. Um, so thank you for not letting me get too far down the road without uh, telling me. Oh, yeah. I need to hear and thinking it might have been. Uh, it's a little, you can turn, yeah, it, no we'll, we'll turn it down on our end a little bit now, but that's, that's better to be able to do that. Okay. Do you, so, would, you, would it be helpful for me to start from the top? I, I think I think you can continue. Okay, uh, sure. That sounds good. Um, so, what, what I was actually, would, would would you introduce Samantha Sweet again? Because I don't think I've met Samantha before, and sure. maybe others have. But uh... um, sure. Uh, so, Samantha Sweet is our um, mental health services director. This committee was probably most um, used to seeing Frank Reed, um, who had spent uh, many years um, as a leader in the Department of Mental Health. And so with his retirement, uh, Sam Sweet came on board. She's been with the department for quite some time as our uh, care management director, uh, as well as our um, operations planning and development director before moving into the mental health services director role. Um, so she'll be joining us as she's um, paramount to a lot of the work that the department is doing um, to support um, individuals needing services um, and having to wait for those services. Thank you for, Samantha, welcome. It's good to say hello. And if we met previously, my apologies. I... That's okay. Nice to meet you all. 
Uh, so I'll just say that, um, you know, DMH takes this issue very seriously. Um, and we understand this is system wide and, and does require our entire community. Uh, we are committed to being a leader and we believe that no Vermonter, uh, particularly children, uh, should be waiting in emergency departments. We also believe that it's critical to diversify our approach um, and we need to take immediate action uh, for people that are in crisis right now um, at this moment, but we also need to consider how to set up our system for future success. Um, therefore, what I'd like to do today is to describe our actions in three parts, um, highlighting what it is we're doing today, um, our plan for improvements for the next 100 days, and then our work to ensure long-term success. Um, so again, I'd like to thank this committee uh, for having us here today, and I will uh, turn things over to uh, Samantha uh, to talk a little bit about what we're doing right now to support um, efforts within the emergency departments. Thank you. Okay, is everybody able to hear me okay? I believe Not so. Having, okay, not having the same audio issues Emily was having. Um, so thanks, Emily. And like Emily said, I'm going to start with what we are currently doing in today's uh, in today's world, um, and then we'll move forward from there. So we continue to commit our children and adult care management teams here at the department to work with state and community partners in triaging and finding the most appropriate bed for both youth and adults waiting for a higher level of care. Most recently, DMH has dedicated care management time focused on youth waiting in emergency rooms, which includes exploring why each youth is waiting and addressing the barriers to the movement out of the emergency room. Uh, DMH facilitates a meeting with DCF every day for a quick working meeting midday to discuss the barriers as to why that youth is still in the emergency room and uh, discharge for, and we also discuss discharge from inpatient units and what are some barriers from discharging from the inpatient unit as we want to keep the flow moving through the system. We want to completely understand why each youth is not moving and to the most appropriate placement in a timely manner. In this meeting on a daily, daily mini huddle, has been pretty effective to identifying what those barriers are um, and moving that youth to that appropriate placement. We've also worked to support individuals to be able to have the choice of being home when they can safely and appropriately do so while waiting for inpatient and or a crisis bed. We have improved our collaboration with both state and community partners and have increased the frequency of our communication. And in one, one example of this is we started a statewide huddle, attending a statewide hospital huddle that occurs every afternoon to highlight the barriers bed availability with a focus on hospitals that are experiencing the most emergency department need. This is a meeting that, um, like I said, occurs every afternoon. Uh, University of Vermont Medical Center facilitates that meeting and many other hospitals join, including the Brattleboro Retreat and a new partner that has come to the conversation is uh, Champlain Valley Physicians Hospital in New York, CVPH. And they have become more integrated into our system. Like I said, they, they come to the daily huddle that I was just, um, that I just spoke about. And they also are included in an update uh, the Vermont Bed Board on a daily basis. We have a better understanding now of who they can accept as CVPH and why. And DMH has provided CVPH with an overview of the Vermont system of care and who the primary contacts are for any kind of discharge planning. And lastly, we are collaborating with state partners 
uh, such as Department of Public Safety. Currently, we have eight out of 10 designated agencies that have been able to hire mental health clinicians that are embedded with state police. And I will turn it over to Allison. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my role is to talk to you a little bit about our, our commitment and understanding that we can't solve this issue with inpatient capacity alone or even triaging emergency department um, weights into inpatient, that we need a really robust, sustainable system in the community for folks to access care when they need it. So we wanted to highlight a few efforts that have happened already um, and the uh, outcomes of those actions. So we worked with the designated and special services agencies <clears throat> to support their ability to keep folks in the community. And we talked to this committee, I believe, back in December about $2 million that went out um, to the designated agency and special service agencies in December for a retention plan. Um, and that was really hyper-focused on 24-7 <clears throat> and emergency response uh, supports in order to retain the staff they have um, because they were having such a struggle, not only with recruitment, but retention. Um, and in addition, as part of that stability package, we have put together a mental health case rate payment model. And with that comes some decisions to be made about how flexible we can be um, with the target set for the agencies, giving the staff in crisis that they have. So we have been incredibly flexible with that model so that we are allowing the agencies to still take in their case rate payments so then they can hire back the staff that they've lost. And so those were two financial efforts in an attempt to stabilize programs that we believe directly keep people out of needing higher levels of care when possible. We wanted to highlight one success uh, with the Howard Center. As of February 14th, the Howard Center's Jarrett House program, which serves younger children, it's an emergency bed stabilization program, is now back to 24 seven. Um, they worked very hard to do that. Um, so the state is not taking credit for that effort, but it certainly came with um, you know, this type of financial stability um, initiatives that, that have been put forward. Additionally, um, we wanted to highlight that during the pandemic, some adjustments were made to support the DAs to be able to send crisis staff to QMHP training virtually. And for those who need a reminder, QMHP training is the training given to crisis clinicians in the community about what is the threshold for someone um, requiring involuntary care um, and all the pieces that go with making that decision with an individual um, because we do not take that decision lightly. And we have found since moving it virtual, it was shortened. Uh, we're seeing some quality issues um, and some limitations with full understanding and best practice with making some of those decisions and submitting those um, applications. And so we are moving back to in-person and expanding that back to a full um, training to ensure best quality um, when it comes to arming our clinicians with the good information they would need. So th that'll be coming up um, in the coming month. Additionally, in re uh, regards to NFI, so I'm thinking about some of the uh, supports we have out there for children and youth, NFI is integral. Um, and they have two programs, one in the North and one in the South of Vermont that serve adolescents um, who are having a mental health crisis. The state was able to supply a contracted um, staffing to assist them with their overnight staffing needs that was allowing um, their hospital diversion program to go back to 24 seven. So that's been something we've put into place a few months ago and is currently in place now um, that has helped to stabilize that program. So my, let, let me just interrupt just to make sure I do understand. So both Jarrett House and NFI's crisis uh, bed crisis intervention programs, which were at one point five days per week, are which is the last time I think we had a report, are back to 24 7 in both settings or all three settings. Is that what I? Yes, we still have some capacity limitations. So they're not back as in all their beds are open, but they are, but 24 7, yes. So 
I should clarify for NFI, they have two programs. The one in the South still has limited bed capacity, but the one in the North um, has been able to get back to almost, they're, they're down one bed right now, um, five out of six. I, I should probably not have interrupted, but go ahead. Representative Black is. I just want to clear um, reminder what NFI is. Oh, North. North well, go ahead. Let them. Northeastern Family Institute. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And they, thank they you. run two, diff two different programs that are, they're both focused on adolescents. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Both focused on adolescents. And what's the, what's the capacity of each of those programs at this point? Representative Lippert, I don't want to get that wrong off the top of my head, so I would love to just double check it. Um, it's six beds, I know, at the North program, and so it just, the South one is new, so I'll double check. Okay. Let, let me not interrupt, let you continue, because uh, we're, we're very interested, particularly in the, the, the addressing the immediate situation as well as, so, you know, the midterm and long term, but, the, but there's, you know, when I see the numbers and we see the numbers, which I think are accurate uh, of maybe as many as 13 or 15 youth waiting in emergency departments. I mean, I hope those numbers are the same numbers you're working with, the ones I pulled up the most recent one. Uh, it, what it doesn't show, what, what I don't get a sense of, and maybe others do, is any flow in, in terms of turnover. Uh, it just continues to be a large number and you don't necessarily get the sense that there's youth being able to move out of that setting. Uh, but maybe you could say something about that as well. Yes, it is an issue in, in the static reports we get. And even when you show a trend, it doesn't follow the individual. So you're right. Um, we do look at that. We look at how many, dish, how many people admitted um, per week, which gives us a sense of movement. <laughs> Um, but that was the rationale for DMH deploying one of our care managers specifically to looking at triage. Um, we have an issue right now with complex youth, um, particularly those with mental health and in the custody of child welfare, who need very specific safety planning to come out of an inpatient setting. And we're finding for any youth with a complexity like that, the community-based services have been really depleted to take them back. Um, and so that's something that we're working on at Agency of Human Services cross department. And so that's why we're meeting with DCF as well to try to manage those needs. We're talking about the need for therapeutic foster care. That's been a really limited resource in the state, um, as well as any step down facility that would require good staffing to support those youth. And that staffing has been incredibly depleted through the crisis, the staffing crisis. So those are the areas we're trying to target to build back up which we think will increase flow again. But we do have a dedicated staff who's kind of facilitating those discussions and looking at them on a daily basis. Is there, is there any indication you can give us? Because I, I, when I noted you said you were meeting with DCF on a daily basis, and previously one of the questions that had been raised was whether how, how many of the youth are actually DCF, youth in DCF custody as opposed to youth coming out of the community who are not in DCF custody. Is there any, I don't know if it's helpful to make that distinction, but uh, it suggests that if someone's in the custody of DCF, there have been other issues that have been at play already. Yeah. It's a good question. We don't have a current analysis that would summarize that in aggregate. And because custody sometimes uh, a moving target. So they may be in custody, in emergency placement custody, but that doesn't last. So we would have to do some thinking through. We do have that for residential. So we're looking at how many youth are put in residential care who are in custody of DCF. In fact, we just finalized that report and that's something we could share, but not at the inpatient level of going in and out. Um, so that's something we would need to talk to folks about, about how to get that done. I'll just so, add, is it okay to add something, Allison? Absolutely. Uh, Please. <laughs> uh, I would add that we don't have a specific report that identifies the numbers of how many kids going inpatient are in DCF custody right now, but we know on an individual level. So when I mentioned earlier about the meeting that occurs midday, it's a working meeting, we know exactly who is waiting and they're in DCF custody. And those are the ones that we're talking to DCF about. 
Thanks, Sam. So yeah. I'm, I'm torn between taking more questions, but I want to give you a chance to finish your comments. And I interrupted. And so let me step back and ask others to hold just so we can at least hear from you first. And then I know there are other questions. Sure. And so we'll keep moving. Um, a important highlight is yes, we have some programs that were already in place that we're trying to bolster for this in the community, but we also recognize there's more needed. And so um, DMH identified that we need to expand community-based crisis response programs, and we put that in our request for HCBS FMAP funding. And so I wanted to highlight a couple programs like CAHOOTS. That's a model that there's interest in in Chittenden County. Um, also, um, PUCS and mobile crisis response teams. Those are things that we have asked to secure funding for through the HCBS FMAP. And we, so that ask has been made and we are planning towards, towards that end. Um, lastly, I really wanted to highlight, as you all know, this is a passion of mine, suicide prevention. And when you do a quick analysis of those waiting for inpatient placement, I just looked at the list today. Um, and I, I hope this committee is aware when we say we think about this a lot and it weighs on us heavily, we look at this list every morning and I look at, we get um, some information from the hospitals about the reason for wait. And I just looked at it this morning to get a count 65% of those waiting were waiting due to a um, suicide risk. And that's not unusual. And so it really highlights for us that if we can find additional supports for suicidality, we may reduce the need for people to go inpatient to meet their, their needs to reduce their suicidality. Um, and so to that end, we wanted to highlight immediate resources we have now <clears throat> that are also going to be bolstered in the future. And we'll talk about that in a moment but the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, the crisis text line for youth, that is a major one that we would love ideas for how to get that out there a little bit more. It's heavily used by adolescents in the LGBTQ community, which we think is wonderful. Um, we also want to get the word out to everyone. Um, and so it's been a great support. We have great data on it and we think it'd be um, really useful if we could spread the word. So those are two suicide prevention specific um, supports that are available right now. And then Samantha, if you want to talk a little bit about inpatient bed capacity. Absolutely. Thanks. And to go back really quickly to answer a question that was asked earlier, NFI South has six beds. Four of them are currently open and occupied, but uh, they run with six beds. So just wanted to close that loop. Um, so to talk about inpatient capacity, um, AHS uh, provided the retreat with contracted nursing supports through TLC, which en enabled additional in inpatient capacity over the past three months. And that will continue until the end of April. Um, the the Bradabar retreat has transitioned four closed adult inpatient beds into four open adolescent beds to increase the adoles adolescent capacity. In addition, they also uh, have Linden Lodge, which is the newly constructed 12 bed level one unit at the retreat. They currently have 10 out of 12 beds. And that's specifically talking about adults uh, that go to Linden Lodge. VPCH has opened more beds and is now up to 21 open. And they were finally able to hire a permanent nurse after having, having the position open for a year and a half. MTCR, which is our secure residential facility, has opened its seventh bed last month and is now operating at full capacity. One area of need that we also saw through the pandemic is um, transportation, the need for secure transportation. Due to the lack of staff uh, sheriff availability, uh, which is related to their own staffing crisis that they are in, uh, which actually resulted in longer wait times in emergency departments where we weren't able to utilize sheriffs that same day or there were hours uh, delay in transportation. We started exploring alternative transportation companies 
and we recently contracted with Youth Transportation Authority, it's YTA. They serve both adults and youth, and uh, they are a secure transportation company that specializes in safe transport of involuntary individuals from the emergency department to the inpatient units. YTA is able to respond within a very short time frame based on the location of the state. So their home base is Montpelier, Burlington area. So if they have to travel to the southern part of the state, it's only the travel time that's the delay. So we've been able to move people much quicker with this new contract with YTA. Do they, do they operate under the same conditions and expectations that the sheriff's departments operate under in terms of uh, nature of transport? Not hard, no hard transport. Yes, yes, we followed the statute. We made sure that they had the training and the um, soft restraints, and that is all that they use. So we still have sheriffs if needed, but we really use the least restrictive form of transportation. So we will always try to use YTA first in order to transport, but if absolutely needed, we still have the contract with sheriffs. Yeah, just to clarify, I mean, I guess it would be good. I, I'm, it's brand new. I'm sure you're going to monitor that data, but it's not just a matter of soft restraints. It's a matter of no restraints as Correct. our standard yep. and what those percentages are when they're we understanding sometimes they're necessary. Yep, and absolutely. We're still tracking all the data. So whether someone needs uh, restraints at all. And so they really highlighted, YTA highlighted, their training and their uh, ability to form relationships before even doing a transport. So they highlighted how majority of their transports don't even use restraints. And so, but it just started, they were able to hire, um, we've only been using them for about two, uh, two weeks now because they needed to hire their own staff. And so all their invoices come in to us and we track all that data. So, so Representative Burroughs has a question. Let's go to Representative Peterson, who I asked to wait, but sorry, we just, we've, we've got so many things to know about, but mm -hmm. uh, let's just use the time we have. Very quick. Um, what does MTCR stand for? Yeah, Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence. Okay, thank you. You think yeah. we know that by now? Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> it's often called the secure residence. We residents. refer to it as yeah. the secure residence. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. like okay. you said, we were that's so indebted. The, that's the that. shorthand that we've used yeah. a lot. So the other acronym. That's, I, I, I didn't know. We, that's that's the stat, well, that's the statutory name is a secure recovery residence, but the department ended up naming it the middle sex. Yeah. So it's that's why it's <laughs> yeah. Yes. My apologies. I'll turn it over to Commissioner Haas. Thanks, Sam. I'll just also, I'd like to just spend a couple more seconds on the transportation issue of folks getting to where they need to go and how valuable it is for YTA to come on board. Um, so it's not only our challenges getting um, sheriff's transport, but also ambulance transport, um, which affects uh, a lot of our voluntary folks who are looking um, and needing inpatient care. Um, so just to highlight that uh, somebody, somebody's wait for um, admission could be impacted by a day or two, uh, depending on uh, sheriff availability. And so we are um, grateful that we have um, worked to find a, a solution that we hope will get us some uh, better results, at least with transporting uh, folks uh, to the right level of care. Um, so I'll, I'll just highlight one last component, although I'll say that we know that our work is not done. Um, we, we do have some other um, more medium and long-term things uh, for us to present today, but by no means do we feel like we should pat ourselves on the back and think that we're, we're good to go and that folks are doing better. So I just, I just want to highlight that. Um, so lastly, uh, we did some um, collaborative work on um, activity kits coming out into the emergency departments for uh, youth to utilize while they wait for inpatient care. Um, 
And so some uh, some hospitals did that, um, went on their own and, and implemented what they felt was best for their emergency departments. Others partnered um, with a, a state entity. Um, I did have a chance to connect with Representative Donahue earlier this week. Um, and so just to be transparent, we have some follow-up and process work to do around the kits to make sure that they don't run out um, and make sure that there's a way for those to get replenished and, and put out to folks because um, they, yeah, they also that, serve a, a valuable piece to the puzzle. That, that had been testimony this committee heard in December from one of the parents that said the first time their child was there last year, they got the kit, it was helpful. The second time they were just told, oh no, we're out of this. Yeah. Uh, so. so we'll we'll continue to to follow up on that uh, specifically, just to make sure that there's some consistent replenishing of those. Um, Could, so can I just ask this question: if if I were if I were in the hospital emergency department, I'm an adolescent. I've the suicidal ideation is part of what's brought me there, and it's been determined that I should stay and not go home because it's not safe for me to go home. What kind of human contact am I having, and with whom? Because sure. it seems to me that's that's rather than just being in a room waiting, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a sterile room, and maybe even with a kit of some kind. I mean, I don't know what else included, but it but it seems to me that the human element is part of what I'm always trying to understand. Like, oh sure, yeah, I that makes sense. Many, really for many young people, isolation is probably a part of what's driving their their difficulties, but. Uh, it, it, yeah, I mean, I think that's exacerbated for children. It's an adult issue too, but right. while people are stuck and we're trying to address the problem, what's happening to them in the moment? Sure. Or and days it, that they're there, weeks. Sure, and it depends on the individual. Um, we know that we have um, some youth who are waiting, whose parents are waiting with them. Um, we also, you know, it's staff are coming and going. Um, and depending on the particular emergency room, you know what they have available for individual supports. Um, screeners are also coming and going, um, and I don't say coming and going lightly. Like they're staying and assessing and working with those individuals. Um, so it really depends both on what that youth has identified they would find helpful for them, uh, as well as um, you know if a parent wants to be with them, that's an opportunity as well. Um, so it, it really depends. So I have to just say, I've been to the emergency room uh, a number of occasions for other reasons, and I regularly see uh, many rooms occupied with someone sitting outside with a computer in front of them. Uh, and, I'm, and when I inquire because I am interested, I say, well, I'm wondering how many of people in the emergency room tonight are here for mental health treatment. And sometimes it's actually more than half of the capacity or sometimes beyond half the capacity of the emergency room. And I see people sitting, waiting for treatment. And I, I just find myself, you know, I don't inquire further because it's not appropriate at that, at that point in time, but I, I, I've witnessed that on multiple occasions when I've happened to have been there accompanying someone for something else. And, and I just always find myself wondering, like, what are the people doing outside the room? They're just sitting, monitoring to make sure they're, I mean, what, what are they doing? And are they interacting in any way? Or are they prohibited to interact? And maybe that's appropriate. I just, but I just would it'd be helpful to understand because usually it's, that's the amount of activity that I've observed. Brian, I'm sorry. And, I, and yeah. then Lori. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. I don't know if there's anybody who can help me understand what that nature of that relationship at the hospitals are, at least the sure. hospital I've seen. Sure, and I think it depends on the hospital. And, and Sam, you're immersed in this every day. So uh, yeah. you're, I'm happy to turn it over to you since you're um, our lead on that, if you want to answer that. But I think it also depends on how that emergency department utilizes um, their staff. But go ahead, Sam. Yeah. I agree with Emily, what she said, it, it depends on the clinical situation that's at hand. It depends on the emergency department. Um, some emergency departments are staffed uh, much richer than other emergency departments. Some emergency departments have psychiatry, which you'll hear about uh, soon in a few minutes. Um, 
where others don't, unfortunately. Some are connected to services in the community and they'll have people stop in, their treatment team may stop in. But as far, it also, like Emily said, it depends on the clinical situation, if it's safe to be in the room or not. I see Representative Houghton has her hand up and I saw Representative Chena did, but I think he disappeared off the screen. So when he comes back, maybe we'll ask him to comment or ask his question. Uh, Representative Houghton. And I can wait if there's more presentation. Um, I wasn't well, sure if we were We're never going to get to everything I'm afraid of today. Yeah. Yeah. The question I have is, is along the same line, is any psychiatry happening at all with these kids that are waiting in the emergency department? Are we, it, it seems to me, I mean, we're on Zoom here. Um, why can't there be a room where an individual goes in and, and a psychiatrist or, or a child psychologist, or, excuse me, maybe not by the right term, but a person who can help the person with his problems, counsels them for 15 minutes, and then the next child goes in and, and we counsel that child, and we, and we give them something. Maybe that's happening, but I, I, I just, we've been at this now for a number of months, and I'm wondering if anything's happening, if, if they're getting any care while they're waiting. I guess what I'm after. I can, I know we're going to speak to the differences and, and issues with access to psychiatry. So if you want, I can just jump right to that because the answer is not everybody has it, especially remote um, hospitals. And so one of the efforts that's underway is to um, expand and implement um, telepsychiatry services to those smaller critical access hospitals. And so DMH is investing $100,000 um, into that effort, but it's a collaborative one that we're doing um, with um, it's more acronyms, so I apologize, with VAS, who hopefully you're familiar with, um, and VPQHC, um, which is the Hospital Quality Network. Um, and so that they have a much larger effort than ours. VPQHC is receiving a million dollars through a federal allocation under Senator Leahy's office um, that will be establishing a Vermont emergency telepsychiatry network. And so DMH is at that table. We're providing the funding that we can at the moment, but it is to get at that issue of how do we not have access for everyone? Um, where don't we have access and how can we bolster that um, so that everybody can tap into it? So that's one of our, we've moved into the next 100 days phase, and I'll try to be brief because I know there's plenty to cover and, and Commissioner Haas is going to end with the vision. Um, but I will just note that beyond telepsychiatry, we also need the emergency department staff to have a good understanding of how to interact with individuals um, who are experiencing any kind of mental health challenge. And so again, a partnership with VPQHC, we have one specifically targeted on suicide prevention. And so it's called the Vermont Suicide Prevention in Emergency Departments, QI, Quality Initiative. Um, and so that is an effort that's bringing that um, training, awareness, understanding um, to the emergency department staff. Almost all Vermont hospitals have signed on. Um, and Importantly, I think this committee knows this um, and, and what you're talking about looking at the data, but there was a recent study on pediatric patients boarding in Vermont emergency departments. And it was found that the majority of the children presented with suicidal ideation or a suicide attempt. That was the most common reason for them to be there. And so this is working towards, towards that aim. Um, additionally, I'm sure Rep. Cena can uh, also attest to the fact that Chittenden County has seen a real increased need for emergency services. The demand there um, has increased disproportionately than other regions of the state. And so we're in uh, conversations of how we can support that region to make sure that they're able to commit to um, engage in their reassessments. So back to the conversation of who's able to visit, treat, assess, with the people who are in the emergency departments, there's an expectation that somebody goes in and reassesses, and that becomes really difficult the more and more and more people that you have. Um, and so the Department of Mental Health is trying to work with that, with that region on that issue. You're aware that we've received a mobile crisis 
state planning grant. And so we're in the process of soliciting stakeholder input on all the things mobile crisis, needs, strengths, gaps, and how the new Medicaid benefit could best support individuals and families. Um, and so lastly, I will just note in this 100 day effort, we had engaged in stakeholder input. Um, that was an ask back, you know, if we go back to last spring, youth waiting in emergency departments was, it was always an issue, but it really heightened an issue at that time. We did some really, what I consider meaningful engagement with the community um, throughout the summer. And we had some follow-up since then. We have another one in May. Things we've gotten out of that are, for example, a, uh, a mother who has said to us how badly she feels the community needs cahoots. Um, that particular model was something that felt uh, promising and had all the right ingredients. And due to that feedback, we were able to explore that and begin partnership with the mayor in Chittenden County. Um, there are other examples, but it's been invaluable for pushing us to continue to have our eye on, on the ground. So I'm gonna turn that over to Commissioner Haas for the future. And let, Commissioner, if I may, before we hear from you about the future, because that's Brian's far off, I'd like to give Representative Chain and Representative Houghton a chance at least to pose their questions. And get yeah, and I was gonna, I agree. I was gonna pause. I think a lot of the things that we'll highlight for the future are things this committee is is aware of of what we're we're working on. So I, I certainly want to make sure we're getting uh, to the questions. Yeah. So Representative China and then Representative Houghton. Yes, I raised my raised my hand a while ago, and then Zoom did something it hasn't done in a while, and it like ejected me, and I couldn't come back. Yeah, we, we saw you leave and come back. Welcome. Yeah. Back. Um, okay, but I did take notes, so I wouldn't be unfocused. Um, so, um, one thing I've noticed is that there, when clients are waiting in the emergency room, I get mixed messages about my role as an outpatient therapist. Like sometimes the client or a family or other team members or someone at the hospital will repeatedly call me and be like, you need to come in and see this person. Um, they need like, you know, they've been here for days and they're like lonely and it's, you know, they just need someone to come see them besides their family, but I don't get paid for that. So, and I'm not allowed to do therapy there. So I literally have to go there and keep telling the client, oh, oh, we can't talk about that because now we're it's becoming therapy, which is frustrating for them because they just want to talk with me while they're there about, they just want, therapy and they can't get it while they're sitting in the ED. No one comes in and gives it to them. And an a reassessment is not therapy. In fact, as, uh, as a clinician, crisis clinician, like reassessments are as soon as quick as possible. You're just going in and trying to prove that they still need treatment in like five, 10 minutes. And then you leave because you have like 30 people or something. I'm not even joking or like 20 people you're trying to get through in a day. So um, I guess my question is, why can't we pay therapists to go do therapy with their clients at the emergency room if that's what the clients really need, if if it works for a therapist? Because I, I know there's some of my colleagues are probably like cringing hearing me say that, like, oh, we're going to be expected to go there too. But I already feel like there's this pressure to not abandon a person in that moment of crisis. And, but yet I'm not allowed to provide the service they need to them there. And I'm expected to go for free and provide like whatever you want to call a 15 or 20 minute visit is, which is actually an hour of my time by the time you park and get to the person, you know what I mean? In the middle of a day with 12 other people, it's really hard. And um, I just don't know if there's a way that we can create like therapy in the emergency room, just like if a person was waiting there for some other medical reason, you wouldn't deprive them of heart medication. You wouldn't not go in and do their physical therapy for their breathing or whatever, you know, whatever it's called, you know, like respiratory therapy, if that's what they need every day, like you wouldn't tell a person with cystic fibrosis, they couldn't get that like shaking thing to, you know, make their lungs, whatever it's called. So like, um, I guess my question is, and I don't expect an answer today, but it's like, can we do something about that? And then, um, oh my God, I took notes. Oh, there they are. Okay. And then The last thing is just, because those were three things in one right there, is um, you were talking about like suicide prevention. And I'm wondering where we're at with the CAMS trainings, because I did the CAMS trainings, um, the collaborative assessment and management of suicidality trainings for, and I just wonder if we're doing more of that kind of work, because it does seem to um, keep people out of the emergency room. And then the last question is, is um, 
What about like harm reduction and how does that play into it? Because harm reduction research is showing it can be applied not only to substance abuse and like risky sexual behavior, but to any kind of risky behavior and cutting and suicidality or risky behaviors. And also when a person's in the emergency room, the way they're treated can be harmful. And if we were training emergency room staff and harm reduction, they might think twice before they say a judgmental thing. And I, I won't even go into the things I hear said when I'm in that environment that are like horrible for, for, for the clients um, to hear and be, and be subjected to. Um, and so I guess that's just another thing is like, how can we like use harm reduction in the emergency setting so that we're not make, causing more damage to someone while they're waiting for help? I know it's a lot, but that's everything I thought about written down at once. Thank you. Just briefly, I would love to respond quickly um, your, to your question about billing in the, in the emergency department. That's something we can talk about. Um, payment reform was intended to break down those barriers, and we allow um, designated agencies to pay for, for example, if someone's inpatient, you should be talking to them about their services after inpatient right from the start. So two years ago, we removed those barriers, and you can bill for that. So I there's there's things that I would need to look into specifically location code. So I don't want to get into that now, but that is something that the door has been open for. And I could circle back to find out if there's anything still standing in the way, um, because that's the beauty of moving away from fee for service is that it's not about an hour spent in one location. It's about what the client receives. Um, and so that should be a change. The second to CAMS is yes, we put it in our grant to the Center for Health and Learning, and that's still a major focus of the department. So they have done some, and there should be another big training coming up. So I can try to get it eight. And then the last for harm reduction, I would say, I'm going to speak for all of us that I don't think anyone here would disagree with you there. And I think it's about the types of trainings and getting them implemented. And thus far, I think the system's been under such stress that it's been difficult to push additional trainings during COVID. And I'd like to see an endemic change that. Thank, thank you. Uh, I, what I would say is like, you know, I'm curious like how it applies to private providers versus the designated agencies, because um, I just don't know. And, and then if, if indeed we find, you find that private providers can be billing in the emergency room, I think that there, it would benefit. Like I get other kind of emails from the state all the time about trainings and regulation stuff. And it would be great to like do some kind of campaign to help people learn how, you know, how, how that works. And then also to maybe talk with crisis about it, because when they do follow up with a therapist, they could say, Hey, if they're here a few days, is there any way you can come see them? And there might be some moment there to create like warm handoff where like they can help set up a therapy session in the emergency room for the client. There's just ways I think we could coordinate better. Um, if this is indeed true. And I think that would actually make a huge, you might see people just leaving the hospital and not even going to the inpatient bed if they start getting therapy in the emergency room, um, which would definitely save the system a lot of money because you're talking about paying someone, a therapist $65 instead of uh, hundreds and hundreds of dollars, if not thousands more. Um, anyway, so I, 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 it's nice to hear that that might be possible for people. I have to clarify to your point that is for designated agencies because they're in this new payment oh, okay. model. Yep. It is so perhaps, yeah, perhaps the answer though is maybe the designated agencies can come up with a way to have like a position that does, I don't know. It's not the same though, honestly, as like having your therapist come see you. So I don't know what the answer is exactly. Maybe there, maybe we need to change it more. I don't know if there's a way to do that, but. Can I, can I make one other suggestion? I know we're short on time here, but we're, we're here. We're, we're benefiting from Representative China's uh, expertise because he actually happens to be a crisis worker. He happens also just happens to be a legislator. And uh, I mean, not just happens, but he is a legislator. And, and we so that's why he's able to bring this into this conversation. I, I hope if there's not an opportunity that there would perhaps be an opportunity to hear from his colleagues who are not legislators as to their experiences in emergency room settings with these same uh, young, young people or adults and benefit from their suggestions, which I think, you know, they're on the ground. So I, I'm just in the interest of time, I'm going to ask Representative Houghton to just be able to weigh in with her question. And uh, Commissioner Haas, I'm not trying to diss your vision for the future, but there's more time in the future to hear about that. And there's more immediacy, I think, on the minds of 
those of us who see these numbers continue the way they are. So Representative Houghton. Thank you, and I appreciate all the efforts and the explanations that have been provided here. And I know no one has a crystal ball, but I'm just curious um, what you think as the experts in this field, when we will see the downstream benefits of everything that's been put in place and that these you know, children and adults will not be waiting this long. I think that is a very good question. I wish I had a crystal ball because we and a lot of other states have been trying to solve this for a really long time. Um, so my hope is some of the things that we're doing are drastic enough that we're going to be able to make, um, you know, change on the short term. Um, but I don't have a crystal ball, but this is the stuff that keeps us up keeps us all up at night, right? Trying to work to get folks to the right level of care when they need it. Um, so I don't have a crystal ball, but I hope we're getting there. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I, I allowed myself to have a side conversation. I missed your comment. It was just a um, comment and it gets me emotional like it gets the rest of us. We don't like folks suffering. So. Yeah, well, I appreciate that we're all share that share yeah. that important center. I think Representative Page, uh, I'm going, I particularly want, and I want to just say that Representative Page has been consistently raising the issue and concern along with others on our committee, not to say that others haven't, but just this is this is an ongoing issue, and I just I want to make sure you get a chance to weigh in. Thank you, Chair. I think we all, as you said, we all have our concerns over this. Can, um, can you speak up a little, Woody? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, we all have our concerns over this. Um, questions on the treatment. Um, how many of, the, of these young adolescents, children, and even adults, how many are, are repetitive patients uh, that we see in, in emergency rooms? How, how successful are we in treating um, these individuals? And, and then finally, we probably have less than two months remaining in, 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 our, in our term here um, before we adjourn and, uh, and then come back next year. Maybe. Maybe. If yeah. we get reelected. Maybe. Or running. But, um, what, what can we do now in this committee to help you, you know, help, you know, Vermonters? Thank you for that question, we, Representative Page. That's a that's a wonderful question. Um, I think twofold. We do have some information about readmission rates, which is a very specific term measuring someone who would be readmitted to a higher level of care in a short term. And so um, we could get you that information. Um, we have that for um, Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. I would need to double check about. Um, you know, say the Brattleboro retreat. So I, we don't have it offhand, um, but that would help to, to, I think, answer your question. The goal is to get people the treatment that they need so they don't need to come immediately back. With that said, sometimes someone may need a higher level of care um, and that that's okay too, um, if that's really, you know, what the person wants and needs. Um, the second piece of your question, I think there are a few things going through the legislature, I'll name um, the bill S69, that has a lot of pieces around suicide prevention efforts that would bolster um, the system, as well as you know some of the support we're doing to try to help the community, um, the community services have a focus on um, holding folks who would otherwise need higher levels of care. So some of the things that you'll see, we've asked for, um, you know, RFIs around different residential programs, but we've also asked and are looking for initiatives for peer supports. Um, and additional, we need more staff out there in the community who could help. Peer supports could be in the emergency departments being supportive to individuals waiting for care. Um, so that is an initiative that we're looking to support. We have $30,000. Um, set aside to do some research on that. Um, so that's one piece. And then the other is the alternatives to emergency departments. So POC, CAHOOT, um, mobile crisis response, those are things that meet people where they're at um, and give them a chance to get those services in the community. 
And we see those as major pieces. And then the last thing I'll name is we're looking to do some diversifying from, from the Brattleboro Retreat as a sole provider of inpatient care for adolescents. Um, and that's something this committee, I believe, is aware of. And we do have one um, respondent to that, which is um, UVM Medical Center. And we do think that's incredibly important because we're moving to into a future where you can't have siloed care. It needs to be integrated care and we need more um, capacity to serve the whole person, which would mean attached to a medical facility. So those are a few things that we're putting out as major priorities. I don't know if anyone else would add anything. Can you say anything more about the timeline in terms of uh, the RFP for youth or children's uh, inpatient services that you mentioned where there's been at least one, there's been one respondent. We have a follow-up meeting with UVM scheduled either the end of this week or next. Um, and then it we're looking at potentially two to three years. Um, so it's, it's, it's a ways out, uh, but we have our first follow-up meeting from the closing of that RFP scheduled. Um, I believe it might be next week, midweek. We'll have a clearer picture after we have a chance to sit down with them. Right, and uh, I see Representative Cordes has a question, but I just wanted to, one last, in terms of, is that RFP, uh, does that focus on a certain capacity or is it wide open? It, what we, we structured it as around 10, really allowing an opportunity for uh, facilities to um, come to us with what they, with what they think um, their community would need or that they would, would serve. Um, from a staffing perspective, it takes about the same amount of staff to staff 10, eight beds or six beds as it would perhaps 10 or 12. Uh, but the target of the RFP was around 12. We wanted to, to have some flexibility for the uh, folks who responded. Thank you. So I think Representative Cordes, you may get the last question. Do you have a question? Yeah, I, um, unless this was answered while I was out of the room, what um, was there, has there been any discussion about what would need to happen for hospitals to authorize clinicians like Brian from providing services in the emergency department? Yeah, we did talk about that. Okay, I'll catch up afterwards. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we had some discussion about what's what's involved there and what, where, where there's actually some flexibility that may not be being realized. That was a great question. Yeah, good. Um, well, I, I think we need to stop now. I know we've gone past the time when you indicated you were available and we have our own deadlines, but uh, I appreciate uh, each of you participating in helping to update us. It helps because the, I, did, I think we just need to stay closely connected on this issue because it's such an, such a pressing and important issue. It's it's one that uh, and one that doesn't seem to go away despite all efforts. Yeah. Uh, but it's also helpful to actually have a sense of where there is some movement and initiative, uh, and I think even in the midst of the frustration for those who frankly are bearing the brunt of this by having to wait, uh, it's helpful for us to know. I, I guess I just lastly say, I've had this said to me by a number of people throughout different parts of the system. What if this was my child? What if this was my family member? How, how completely upset would I be that, they, that I, I reached out for psychiatric help for a family member who might not have even wanted the help or might not have realized that, that we were saving them from some other tragic tragic end and only to find that what I found out was that we didn't really get help. What we got was waiting and more waiting and how increasingly frustrated that family and that family member might be. So I think it's, it's very, it feels very personal at a level that is hard to explain, but I think everyone on the screen understands at the same time. So uh, I, and I trust and know that you do share that concern, each of you. So thank you for your work and uh, let's, let's stay connected about this. Uh, and I, I welcome you. And I say this uh, in a, 
let me say this in a in a way that's an invitation and not a not not not, not any kind of veiled you know coercion or something, but please feel free. I think it's helpful actually, frankly, for you to take some initiative toward us on this issue periodically as well, because sometimes it just feels like we're kind of sitting, waiting to hear something. And, and then, that, then that raises the frustration level, I think, all around when, in fact, you're working very hard to try to address issues, so. I hear you, thank you. Okay.